Okay, a very warm welcome to you this evening as we start looking at the National Trust and asking whether or not this uh, very famous institution is the purveyor of fake news. Why are we asking this question? Well, during the last week, the National Trust produced this report um, exploring the links between historic places, colonialism and slavery. Now, surprise, surprise, the National Trust uh, concluded as part of the report was actually commissioned about a year ago that something in the region of 93 of their sites have some sort of link to colonialism and slavery. In many respects, you might be asking, well, did you really need a report to establish that? Um, we are dealing with an organization that is responsible for some of the most elite structures, um, architectural structures uh, across the entirety of the island. Um, we're dealing with narratives of wealth and privilege, and it seems almost inevitable that in that sort of context, whilst dealing with British history, that there are going to be some of those links um, going back to slavery and colonialism. So the contents of this report um, shouldn't really be surprising anybody. Um, that the report was done is important. Um, is it fake? Well, no, not at all. As, we, as I'll stress repeatedly in the course of this video, um, nothing about the report should surprise um, and indeed that there's such general ignorance um, about the relationship that many of the sites that the National Trust maintain and slavery and colonialism, or at least the negative narratives of colonialism, if there are positive ones, that's a discussion in a video for another time, um, that that's a surprise to people is perhaps a cause for concern. More generally, the report is a good thing. Um, Britain uh, in terms of its relationship with its history and the way we explore history through our heritage sites and museum institutions um, has, generally speaking, been pretty poor at exploring the relationship between um, British society and slavery. We've been very, very good at celebrating the role of Britain in relation to abolition of slavery. But when it comes to acknowledging the fact that Britain might have been even just a tiny bit complicit in the process of the slave trade or was in any way uh, a financial beneficiary of the slave trade, that's something that for a very long period of time we managed to uh, persuade ourselves to sort of turn the other cheek towards, to, to find ways of cushioning that narrative out of our interpretive priorities. In the last sort of five to ten years, institutions across Britain have become much better at this. Um, institutions are much more aware of both the fact that there is this narrative, but also the need to acknowledge it. Um, and this is something that we're doing in universities, in museums, with institutions like the National Trust. However, despite this report, which again, commissioned over a year ago, this isn't some sort of knee-jerk response to the Black Lives Matters movement this year. The report was commissioned over a year ago, um, and it's taken that long to conduct the research and publish the findings this week. Um, and even though there are the findings in that report should not surprise anyone, they seem to have done exactly that. Indeed, the findings seem to have angered quite a lot of people. If we dip a toe into the murky waters of social media, and just look at this one post, if you were to go to Twitter and put in National Trust um, any day this week, um, you'll come up with a host of really quite negative um, criti uh, critical commentaries, uh, really attacking the National Trust. Um, so here, we have one post that just says, today we publish a report on the colonial links of properties now cared for uh, by the National Trust. Our intention is to be open and honest about history, no more, no less than that. The National Trust reassesses colonial history of properties. Okay. Now, organisations that are responsible for the management uh, and presentation of historic sites, I would suggest there is an emphasis on them to present balanced factual historical information. When it comes to issues of was this a good thing, was it a bad thing, 
that's a different scale of interpretation. And I would suggest that's something that is open to everyone. But making the choice to ignore vast tracts of factual information is particularly problematic. That's where we start creating and curating a narrative that might make us feel comfortable or might make us feel less comfortable. This is not a narrative that is intended to make people feel comfortable, but it is a narrative intended to educate people about the realities of the funding uh, that went into a large number of these National Trust properties. But if we work through some of the comments here, some of the responses to this one post, and you can do it with all sorts of posts, um, it's somewhat telling. So here, um, first, first response, uh, this is not what the Trust was designed to do will not renew our membership. And you see a lot of uh, posts like this of people saying, we're not going to renew our membership, we're going to tear up our National Trust cards. I suspect the vast majority of those people were never trust members in the first place. But it still reveals that simmering sense of hostility um, towards the trust and this very specific form of research that they're conducting. Um, not what the trust was designed to do. Well, the trust was designed to, as we've just mentioned, care for curate and present sites of historical significance. Part of presentation should, I would suggest, involve dealing with a presentation of the historical context and narratives that feed into the creation of these sites, whether they are uncomfortable or not. Yet for some people, the concept of dealing with that narrative is uh, offensive, uh, for want of a better phrase. Here, the third comment, why do you get to be the ones to reassess history? Well, that's an interesting question. Who should be the ones to reassess history? Um, one would probably suggest that this individual would have issue with historians reassessing it. I don't know, is this poster uh, suggesting that perhaps the, I don't know, the cast list of the Great British Bake Off should be the ones to be conducting the reassessment of history? I would hope that it's professional scholarly academics who might be at least first in line to have a crack at reassessment as and when it happens. But is reassessment really what's happening here? Or is this simply uh, a recognition that there is a broader, more complex narrative than that which is currently presented to wider audiences? Um, we can keep going through here. There are some positive comments that come out. It's probably around about 50-50, but I think what, what should concern us is those narratives which are, are very hostile um, to this. Um, I like this. Is there a risk that this report provides easy targets for criminal damage? Um, you know, we're sort of getting into the Project Fear narrative here again, aren't we? Um, so down here, open and honest, really. Do you think most people don't know that previous owners of grand buildings may have traded in slaves. Don't be so patronising. I quite like to enjoy the gardens and architecture when I visit National Trust places. If I want a sermon on piety or impiety, I'd go to church. I suppose that sort of nails what we're talking about here. Um, it's one post which sort of summarises all the issues uh, that I want to deal with in the sense of do you think most people don't know that previous owners of grand buildings may have traded in slaves? Um, I'm going to jump on that and say uh, no. I think that most people don't know that. Um, general uh, awareness levels of the history of slavery in a British context, and you can play the same game in North America um, as well in relation to things like the Holocaust. We've just seen a report uh, produced in the last week or so suggesting a, a, a quite concerning level of adult, um, the adult population in the States has no real understanding of the Holocaust and the loss of life. So um, that this should be something that people have an awareness of doesn't equate with the uh, practical realities of whether these people are aware. Um, so, I mean, in answer to that first point, do you think that most people don't know that previous owners of grand buildings may have traded in slaves? Well, I would suggest that the vast majority of people in Britain, no, do not have that knowledge. And one of the reasons they don't have that knowledge is that reports like this one produced by the Trust didn't exist until, what, Tuesday? Yeah? 
but there hasn't been that formal acknowledgement by organisations of the stature of the National Trust. So they are challenging uh, a major gap. Um, sorry, I've got other people commenting on things there. Um, they say, don't be so patronising. I quite like to enjoy the gardens and architecture when I visit National Trust places. Well, sure. Um, we like our historical narratives to be comfortable. I say we, I'm using that in the broadest sense. I, I kind of prefer my historical narratives to be challenging. Um, but for many people, keeping things safe and cushioned and trying to look past that which is uncomfortable is often a preference. But it's a problematic preference because it's uh, an active process of willful ignorance. It's for this poster, they're saying, yes, I'm fully aware of the links with slavery, but don't tell me about them. I don't want to go to a historic site to be educated about these details. And that's a problem. This last point um, on piety, if I want to sermon on piety and piety, I'd go to church. It sort of links back to one of the first points I made about interpretation. I don't think anywhere in the report by the National Trust that the contributors to it are saying, well, this person was bad because they had links to slavery, or this property is bad because it had links to slavery. What the report does is say the person who funded this building had links to slavery. This building was partially funded by money derived from slavery. That's sort of that critical judgment of good, bad, um, evil, if you want to put that into the mix, that's not what the report is about. Nobody's saying these things. And the sort of the knee-jerk response that that is what is taking place here is also a point of concern. I think it's reflective of an interesting challenge that we have as historians and heritage professionals. For a significant period of time, especially uh, through heritage organisations but also through museums, we have been encouraged as practitioners to empower audiences, to invite audiences in, to let our audiences tell us what they want to know about their histories and try to curate collections and exhibitions in responses to them. How do we as practitioners engage with that process when we have uh, quite vocal groups, not necessarily majority groups, but quite vocal groups who are saying, you know what, we don't want to hear about this. Yeah. Yes, 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 we know that slavery was part of Britain's historical narrative, but don't tell us about it. Don't educate us about it. We do not want to know. Or indeed, people who turn around with statements, and we see this sort of thing on social media as well, of you shouldn't rewrite history. Well, is an acknowledgement of the links of some National Trust properties with the process of slavery an act of rewriting? I would suggest it's a process of acknowledging an omission of fact in previous uh, forms of interpretation at the site. But we do have this challenge. Um, and in part, it's it's reflecting this wider narrative of anti-intellectualism, the legacy of Michael Gove saying people have had enough of experts, that those with expertise in the field, those who have been conducting research on the relationship between uh, Britain's colonial history and the slave trade and the impact in relation to architectural landscapes, for instance, are making the argument to say, well, yes, these links were real. And yet there is this vocal, hostile a uh, subsection of British society that says, no, it wasn't. Don't tell us that. That's fake news. I don't have a, an answer to this question, but how, as practitioners, do we confront that narrative? Especially when there is um, a fairly well-practiced narrative that academics are seen to be looking down on people who have this and a very staunch set opinion that we shouldn't be dealing with this narrative, that there's no need to drag up the past, or that by acknowledging slavery and its links with British society that we are rewriting history. None of these things are applicable or accurate, yet there is such a, a momentum behind it that we could very easily find ourselves in a situation where historians, academics, museum professionals, whatever it might be, are being condemned for acknowledging that Britain was, uh, you know, 
if you don't like the word complicit, let's uh, let's simplify it even further. Let's say it was involved, that Britain was involved in the slave trade. That's quite a scary thought, that we could feel pressured out of acknowledging these things. And I think this is why this report is really quite useful. I think it's something to reflect on as students of history and as heritage practitioners. Again, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I don't, I don't know what the answer to this is. When you have what are claiming to be audiences of National Trust properties or historic monuments more generally in a British context who do not want factual details about the history of these sites to be shared with them as they make use of the site. A historic site without context is it's bricks and mortar. You know? It's carefully arranged rocks. Without the context, I would suggest these sites are by and large worthless. Um, you know, I come from this from an archaeological perspective where, where context is sacred. I would apply that to all historical periods, all historical sites. Without context, these things are worthless. But we are fighting against a tide of opinion that says we do not care about context, just give us pretty buildings. And that's a very difficult thing for us to deal with. Um, perhaps as we go through uh, the coming weeks and months and we see more responses to this, maybe I'll try and conjure up an answer to this problem. But for now, it is certainly something that we as practitioners need to give some thought to as to how do we confront because at the moment we're seeing a lot of hostility to our approaches to acknowledge just very basic historical narratives, factual details of that which happened, which people just don't want to hear about. So is the National Trust the purveyor of fake news? Again, no. But a lot of people believe that. How do we deal with that? I would welcome reflections and comments in the section below uh, as we discuss this further and try to make sense of how to move forward when there's such a hostile attitude towards the factual realities of British history.